Wow. Wow. Hey everyone, welcome to That Pedal Show. Dan here. Mick here. Mike here. Hello. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, the wonderful Mr. Mike Van Art joining us today. And uh, I'm so excited. Finally. Yeah. <laughs> it, it's been a long time coming. Actually, Mike, what we didn't say uh, in the intro was that's the camera we look at, not the one, oh, right, not, okay, not that the one. one Hayden's behind. Yeah, right, sorry. Okay, sorry. Poor yeah. instruction on my part. Um, we have been talking about doing this for ages because... Dan, you have a relationship with Mike. Indeed. Professionally, of course. <laughs> well, you know. Hey, I'll take what I can get these <laughs> days, man, to be honest. Yeah, nothing to judge. Um, <laughs> I've known you since, wow. Uh, when been a while with all the biffy, been, work, yeah, biffy yeah. years, you know. Yeah. yeah. Um, funny story. Well, you judge if it's funny or not. Uh, when I first met Mike, I was doing a... Uh, a rig for Simon and went down to help out Cherb or something. Simon who? S Simon Neal from Biffy Claro. Thank you. And the boys at the office, so I'm, sort of, I'm going down to see Biffy today. And they went, are you going to, are you going to see Mike Vanna? And I went, yeah. <laughs> and they were like, really? And I went, yeah. And, uh, and they said, um, they said to me, you know, you know, Mike from Ocean Size, and I hadn't heard Ocean Size at that point. Then I did, and it was like, holy poo things. It was just... Well, I was only one of three guitarists in that band. We were we were nearly all guitar players in that band for the most part, but... Yeah. Um, Gambler was playing Gambler, guitar as well. Gambler played guitar. He actually played a guitar that he made. He couldn't actually play guitar until he built one and joined our band, and we had Steve DeRose as well. Hi, Gambler. Hi, Steve. Awesome. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but but since then I've been a big fan of everything that you've done. Actually, to that point. Oh yes. All right, I. Oh, I, these I, things, man. God. So I bought this when this came out. Um, hey, man. A signature pedal of yours. They're great fun. So I still good. Love them. Yeah. So good. Yeah, because it, I, I remember seeing the ad for this. Yeah, and it's like well, I ha I have to get one of those. That's great. It's Isn't a that great? real Velcro-y sound, like the big cheese kind of thing. I love yeah. that thing, man. Just it, and if, this is this is what ten years old now, or something. Uh, or? 15, 2015. Yeah. <sighs> okay. Right. Did make a lot of them. Maybe you know sixty or something. Right. They're great fun. Really great. Really great. Um, so we want to get into. Uh, man, so much stuff to talk about. I want to talk about obviously um, you, your new project, uh, Empire State Bastard. But I want to talk about Ocean Size, um, British Theatre. Uh, I want to talk about Manchester. I want mm. to talk about left handed guitars. All oh, right, yeah. Um, and, you know, I want to talk about, let's start off with this. From your very first album with that I heard with Ocean Size, your fuzz sound was like fully formed. You know what I mean? Right. It's, even though I've, 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 there's been changes I've heard through the years, from the moment that you went, this is me, my name's Mike, <laughs> you had this incredible fuzz thing that's right. sort of been a part of your sound through everything. Yeah. Where did that come from? As soon as we sort of got going with Ocean Size, we were just all obsessed with the Big Muff. Right. Um, yeah, it was, and they weren't even such a big deal. It felt like you know, like late nineties. Yeah. It, it, and I was never a big Smashing Pumpkins fan, but that they, they apparently brought it into the mainstream. But I'd I'd never heard of it. Wow. And uh, and we just all really took to it, and it kind of felt like you could all have one, and it it. Like the more the more the merrier of that kind of thing, you know. Um, but just such a thick sound. Um, not necessarily great for some of the chuggier stuff, so we'd always rely on amp distortion for that. Right. Uh, but yeah, I really grew into that stuff, and I've you know I've got more fuzz pedals than anything. And there's so many different kinds of it, and they're all just so much fun. You know, I just I can't get enough of it. Yeah. Know? Is that, I'm gonna do, may as well just dive straight into it. Is that why the uh, 
uh, this is on there, or is that all rats? That's all rats. It's the JHS pack pack rat. Yeah. So where's the muff sound coming from then? This is a, a, a Frederick. Oh, okay. Uh, green big muff clone. Because at, at the time, uh, you could only get one big muff. So I, I just bought a few clones of, of various things because I just wanted uh, the best one. And that was mm. always, the green one was always the most fucking aggro, you know. Excuse me, I just swear, am I allowed to swear by the mm, way? Right. We'll, we'll, we might bleep it. Right, okay, no right. worries, right. That's all right. Mm. We, noted, did, we, we did have a certain Mr. Gallagher on the show. Oh, right, yeah, 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 okay. There's no way he's going <laughs> to... Who's gonna used to an F-bomb or three. Bit, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Can we have a quick listen to that? Yeah. Um, uh, and then there's something I want to compare it to, because I, I have a related question. Okay. Um, I'm turning this on and off, because because uh, it's cranked, and there's a ton of game running in it, it's a bit noisy. But... Well, if you want to hear the muff on its own, just turn that one okay. on. All right. Uh, yeah, that should be on, I guess. Uh, I'm, bigger. Right. Oh, I think it is on. Yeah, yeah okay. <laughs> just got a bit of a growl to it you know i think you get more mids out of the green big muff it's just got a yeah. little bit more push to it you know it kind of it it tees into the the question i wanted to ask because what i'm getting there i don't know whether it's because we've got a uh, oh no it's just the 212 we're hearing isn't it yeah yep. the bottom end is is completely together it's yeah, not yeah. flubbing out it's yeah. not yeah. all over the place and that's kind of having had a flick through the back catalog one of the things that seems to uh, be in the, the tones that get recorded anyway is it's tight. Yeah, yeah. Even though with down tuning mm. and fuzz and loads of amp distortion, it's never flubby and yeah. it never flubs. No, oh, I, I can get to that stuff. <laughs> I, I do like that. I like the sort of slow attack on some things. I've got pedals that do that. But for the green muff, you can sort of still get that that yeah, like a tight attack and stuff. It's yeah. good fun. So rewinding out of that then, what, how did you come to, to love those guitar sounds so much? What was it that um, you were listening to? Or? I don't know. I, I, I mean, I started off, you know, when I was a kid, just being obsessed with Black Sabbath from a really early age, like stupidly early. Uh, I was like seven and I got like the box set with the first six Sabbath albums. And, and, awesome. and I feel That's like awesome. you, you can't really, once you're obsessed with Black Sabbath at a young age, you can sort of, you know, dip your toe into all these different things, but you're still obsessed with Black Sabbath and oh, you can't, yeah, yeah, yeah. you're not going to escape that because Black Sabbath are fucking incredible. You know? <laughs> yeah. um, Was so, the yeah. fact that Tony's a, a left? No, I didn't. No, I, I, I was already playing by then. Yeah, yeah. Um, I just was like, cool, well, I can get away with it if he can, you know. <laughs> I don't know what that means. <laughs> you know, there's not, there can't be that much stigma attached to this stuff. I'm not really a witch. Yeah. <laughs> did anyone hit you across the back of the knuckles? No, I did really? try and play right-handed because, they, you know, that's everybody advised me. It's like, you know, nobody will teach him. And then uh, it's true. I, I, I struggled to find a teacher. No way. How? Yeah, yeah. What? I know. It's and, just like looking into a mirror. And then surely. I found a guy and then he... He married my mother. What can I say? That's another story. We'll, we'll leave that one out. <laughs> that is a, a true story. <laughs> it's a true story. Yeah. Oh, okay. So I got free guitar lessons and everything <laughs> worked out nicely. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Nice. Um, we, we must come back to the left-handed thing because like, there's there's an interesting discussion there. Let's let's continue on our first route. So the other, I appreciate this is digging in a bit deep quickly. Quite early. The other thing, there is a sound you get that's kind of got this, and there's going to be loads of technical terms here, loads of interesting adjectives like splatty. You're going to say, yeah, yeah, yeah. And yeah. farty. And <laughs> <laughs> but there's something that happens on the bottom end of one of your fuzzes, and I don't know which one it is. It might be the one that says doom on it. Right. Um, which, again, it doesn't mush out into nothing, but it does have this almost like borderline synth. Right, yeah. Totally yeah. square wave. Yeah, thing. yeah. Um, that would probably be this... Um, does it doom doom saw, which is basically a, a, a an HM2 dimed, so you don't have to waste any time turning all the knobs up. Somebody's gone to the trouble of doing that for you. It <laughs> saves it loads of time. Look at the graphic on this, it's and tell me if it saw, could be man. anything else. I know that is fantastic. That it's is, wonderful. That's pure metal. So I mean, what how this is working is 
you know, the, the orange is taking the pedals, whereas the mat amp, which isn't turned on yet, is uh, that that's just a constant distortion. So that's the, that's kind of the face of my sound because it's just got such a thick, rich, grainy distortion, just the amp. So And then the orange sort of changes colour behind it. So this, this this is just the orange at the moment. If you play that, and then I'll switch the meta amp on right, okay, sort of halfway right. through. It doesn't play nice when you stop playing, though. There is almost like a synthy glitchy thing going yeah, on. Yeah, I like that. And there's been a, a lot of times, I think, especially early on with Ocean Size, where we tried to sort of utilize the pedals in a way that, because we didn't want to have a keyboard player. We got into that eventually, but it just wanted to be, so we're just using delay and like stacked delays and mm. stuff to make it sound like a sort of pad. Yeah. You know, and and when you've got three guitars doing that, it's just absolutely glorious. You know, and we 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 really we milked that to the nth degree. <laughs> what was the, what were the tuning relationships? So you say there's three guitars. Yeah, who's tuned where? What, we were all tuned to just D standard. Uh, okay, open. Yeah, what? Yeah, sorry. Just, yeah, yeah, just yeah, regular regular tune down a step, but we somehow had this sort of. Um, just intrinsic knowledge of where to fit in. Right. And we never played the same thing. I don't think right. there was ever a point where we were all totally copying each other. And it just seemed to it just seemed to work. I tended to find my parts pretty fast when we were jamming. I'd be like, all right, this is what I'm gonna do. And then the other two would just fit in around it. And it just it just I don't know, it it made for this really cool sort of mosaic effect of, you know, we were all really into Steve Reich and and that kind of minimalism of different cells of motifs and things that can all be going on at the same time just to create a more sort of immersive experience. It can be quite physical when you've got these different things all moving at a different meter all at the same time. Yeah. We did, a lot, did that quite a lot. So one of the things about Ocean Size that I love, there's, I mean, this sounds a silly thing to say, but within the music, there's so much music yeah. Um, like you say, there are different, uh, you'll have three different parts going on, but they're all different melodies and it's all counterpoint. And yet you'll also find a way for a vocal melody to sit on that and you'll find a way for all the guitars to be loud in the mix and yet nothing gets in the way of the vocal. Uh, then out of nowhere, this riff will come in and just take your head off. <laughs> you never really, you, it always keeps you on your toes because you're never really sure what direction it's going to go in. The and when these melodies do come in, you know, some of these just achingly beautiful and they kind of they almost get your guard down to a point that when you do come in with it's like it's so effective. And this is happening, like I said, from the from album number one. Mm. So I mean, you know, having done a bit of I mean, you know, I don't know whether you'd um balk at the term progressive rock but the reason i use the progressive term is because there's so much you know influences from everything I, i'm hearing the complication of zappa the the un, the unpredictability of cardiacs in there okay. but these this it's anything but four four it's isn't it? absolutely <laughs> anything but four four verse chorus yep verse chorus middle eight chorus end it's absolutely anything but that but well, it's so, it's always musical and it's always you know so how does a band get together and for their first album and come up with stuff like that and consistently deliver that we, sort of we thing? didn't really know what we were doing we certainly didn't know how to write a song in the early days and we were all just feeling each other out. Mark, the drummer, was absolutely phenomenal. He was quite the ringleader in terms of Amazing. direction and yep. what, what, you know, he had great taste. So it was like, you know, 
let's try this, let's try that. And he, you know, a lot of the songs came from his beats. He just wow. would have a beat every day mm. and, he, you know, it, you, you'd try and sort of keep up with him, really. Uh, but no, so in the early days, we didn't really... Didn't, I think we had an identity crisis for, for like a couple of albums where we were like, you know, setting down, trying, should we try and get something on the radio? Let's write a song. Okay. And that didn't <laughs> fucking work either. So <laughs> like, the next album, let's make sure all the songs, we don't worry about that. And it's just, you know, so everything on the third album is just all 10 minute tracks, you know. Um, yeah, I don't know. I, I, it just, we everything was really instinctual. It was really organic. Mm. And all we used to do all day was jam and, and, from the very first day, you know, we'd just have a tape machine running the whole time, wow. just on a four track, just ev whenever anybody's playing, make sure that tape is rolling because we were all smoking so much fucking weed back then. We couldn't remember, <laughs> yeah, we, you right. know, five minutes later, you wouldn't remember what you played. So we right. had to keep it rolling all the time, no matter what. Um, and then, you know, we moved when we could afford it. We, we got an advance and we bought a, a little laptop to record on and all that. And Did so you ever go back and listen to stuff and go, I don't remember playing that. Oh, yeah. Well, we, we got all those cassettes recently. We got them all digitized. And I'm like, I have no... Who's this? You know? Um, it's pretty It's pretty good fun. But, yeah, we've got an awful lot of recordings of arguments because we left the tape rolling too much. Like, oh, God. Skip, skip, skip. I know, I know the fans are going to want to hear that. I know, yeah, yeah. yeah. Oh, it's a ridiculous But it's way. interesting. Sometimes those sort of relationships in bands... Are the things that create out yeah, of that tension? Things well, I'm a out. big Faith No More obsessive, and right. they hated each other, and that, that you know one of the greatest bands of all time. I can't say that that's what made it, but definitely um, we were all striving to impress each other oh, and frequently wow. failing. So it just made you try harder. Like, ah, it's really really tough. But you know, you know, I'm proud of the records. Yeah, they stand up. I think you know, and we've influenced a whole bunch of shitty bands. So. <laughs> We've done something right. Yes, yeah, so right. What is it? So, what about the? If there's a word I could use uh, to describe your music, it is ambitious, and right. the ambition in the sonic space that's created, mm. but also in the arrangements and the production. How does one? So, in 1998, you'd have been what? 22. Yeah. yeah. So a young man. Yeah. Where does one get the confidence to yeah. to go? Oh, we we've got this ambition. I was a big David Lee Roth fan. You legend. <laughs> you absolute hero. <laughs> oh man, that is awesome. I mean, what's your favorite DLR album then? Oh, even Smile. Wow. Come on. Oh, Thank you. Just, I saw him twice on yeah. a skyscraper yeah. tour, yeah, man. Yeah, yeah. It was like some people say other things, and I'm like, how how can there be another? <laughs> 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 no, I mean, we we had that on recently. And, it, you know, I, I, there's a friend of mine called Carvis who's from Cardiacs and Gong. And we still listen to those records. We had Eat Him and Smile on the other night and Diary of a Madman by Aussie. So, like, things that we loved in the mid-80s. Yeah. And we're like, this is still our music. Like, yeah. when you, you can trace, like, sort of harmonic tricks that Steve Vai uses and, 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 and Randy Rose and all that's like... I'm still trying to do that shit. Yeah. I'm still trying to make songs that that do that. You know, it's it's, it's just ingrained into it. There's know? a couple of uh, Steve Vai things that in in some of your um, drones and stuff, you'll from this minor dirge, you'll come up to a major seventh and 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 leave it there. And it's like, and I've heard Steve do that right. a couple of times, but it's yeah, it's what? just so powerful, and and that's so why I can hear little bits and pieces of where. You've, th this stuff has influenced you, yeah. but it's just come together. It's um, <laughs> well, that's that's definitely what I what I was into. But I I didn't realize what psychedelic rock really was when I was right. listening to Eat 'Em and Smile in nineteen eighty six or something. But I could hear that Steve Vai. I didn't know about Frank Zappa in those days. I was only like nine, but I was just like, there's something so unorthodox about this play. And I'd yeah. heard Van Halen, I'd heard, heard all that, but with Vai, it just felt like he was coming from some kind of psychedelic edge that I didn't recognize yet. And right. Yeah, just the the wrong notes. Like what, what what's that? Yeah. What is that, you know? That is fascinating because that takes you off on the journey that you've gone down. I mean, you you clearly have all the facility to have been a shredder. Yeah. If you were going to go in that direction. So you're obviously pretty serious about your guitar playing when you Oh, were I was much better kid. when I was like 13, but I've, I I kind of had to unlearn everything. Right. Because I don't know, I when I got to university and all that, and I, you know, I had Ibanez 
Yeah, like RG550 or that. What Pro colour? What colour? They only did it in black, man. It's yeah. left-handed. You can't get uh, it. factory standards, man, honestly. And of course. Shouldn't complain now. I've got There's all me. the guitars in every colour, man. <laughs> right-handed privilege. But I know, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> um, but so I, when I went to uni, I suddenly sort of got into like pavement and mm. and Johnny Greenwood and stuff like that, where he's just like watching these players going, this is a complete, like ripping up the rule books because I, I felt like with with Vi and all that and I went to see at a very early age I saw um, Alan Oldsworth oh. and just being like well there is nowhere else to go from yeah, here this it. is just the absolute pinnacle mm -hmm. of, of achievement in you know in tech in terms of technique and then yeah I'd like Steve Maltmus just using just these absolutely deranged tunings and and Johnny Greenwood just playing the wrong notes as scruffily as possible. And I was like, what's that? I need, I need to investigate more of that. So I just kind of lost a load of my technique and I, you know, I kind of bring it back in its own little way, but I was a lot better back then. I was really fast, you know. I, I like the way we equate fast with better. Yeah, I know, yeah. <laughs> there, just before we kicked off today, uh, Mike did a couple of jams and was playing a bit and we've heard his work on all kinds of music and, it's a different kind of good, isn't it, to be able to put it across in that, in the way that you do, so that some of the music is super complex. It has loads of intricate parts, and that in itself is a, an incredible facility to be able to just get that out with different sounds and stuff. Yeah, I think that like it's always been the idea. I, I never wanted to be in a band that only other dudes in bands listen to. Right. I don't know if I've necessarily got that bit right yet, but I'm always just wanting to make tunes that are sort of in different shapes to other tunes and just, mm. you know, all my favourite bands do that, you know, Cardiacs or Biffy as well, you know. It, it, it's all, it's rock, but not quite as you've ever heard it before. Sure. And I just always wanted to fit into that sort of umbrella, really. And, and Ocean Size from day one was that. Uh, and I've tried to, tried to do, and that, you know, this, you know, this new band, Empire State Bastard with Simon, is 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 treading that bent path as me and my mate like to call it you know just just making it just slightly wonky in some way you know
let's let's jump forward to there because there's there's a whole other things between there and and Postate bastard but i have to ask how did that come about empire state bastard you and you've written all the material well i've written the music yeah, yeah simon yeah. wrote the, the simon wrote vocals the, and all that right. yeah so it's you and simon you've got dave lombardo on drums <laughs> and it is it's just epic yeah. so it's heavy as shit it's just man alive <laughs> it's great. a guitar change coming here i, I um I shaved 10 minutes off my journey today listening to that coming here. Yeah, yeah. Oh, it is. It's so good. So when I was listening to it, I didn't know it was Dave Lombardo. And right. I'm hearing all this like very distinctive drumming that I didn't quite put my finger on and thinking that's kind of thrashy. I mean, it's really thrashy in parts. And then yeah, yeah, you say yeah. it's him, it's like, oh. oh. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> because you, like, if I try to think it was a couple of years ago or 18 months ago or whatever. And you, you said to me, oh, I've got this thing together and I had this idea. I really wanted a drummer like Dave Lombardo. I know, I'll get Dave Lombardo. So how did this come together? Well, it's it's been basically a completely mythical, almost a joke of a band for about 12 years. I started playing for Biffy in 2010 and, you know, we were partying a lot more, staying up late and listening to the most extreme music we could find. That was since I met Simon in 2002, that's basically been the basis of much much of our relationship is just playing each other the most mental things we could find, the most left field, be it metal or be it anything, you know, psychedelic stuff or, you know, anything. Um and then it was always the dream from, from even from back then that we would have our own freaky band and he got the name in 2010 and he was like, it's going to be called this. And then I was like, cool, what's it sound like? Because he'd already started talking about it in, in interviews. <laughs> and I was like, what, what, what's it going to sound like? And he just went, all, all I remember is him saying, heavy and vital. I'm like, right, okay. And I set about immediately trying to throw things at him that I thought fit that. But I wasn't in the right headspace. I'd just come off the back of Ocean Size and I was kind of licking my wounds a bit, mm. listening to sad indie boy music. <laughs> and uh, and then, yeah, just sang, kind of turned a corner with that a few a few years back and I just wrote some of the most f horrible, sort of hardcore blast beat stuff um, and sent it to him. And I was like, is this what Empire State Bastard was supposed to sound like? And it was like, the, the best response, which was, what the fuck is this? Is this you? And and that was it. We were off to the races after that. And then, like I say, when I was uh, programming each, I programmed all the drums and, you know, making demos for, for Simon. And then the, the guitar always said Tony Iommi. The, the bass track always said Shane Embry from Napalm Death. And the drums, as I programmed them, always said Dave Lombardo. Uh, and then when it came to it, you know, we were sort of, sending tapes to all our friends who we knew who drums we, we weren't casting the net that wide it's like who do we know who we want to be in a band with and they all came back going i can't do that like, <laughs> i can do every, all of that double kick stuff no chance and i was like shit man we need we need somebody who plays like dave lombardo who would that be <laughs> and and it was like and then this is kind of a running thing in my life to be quite honest just like all you've got to do is ask sometimes you yeah, know right. And that's how I ended up sort of doing the Biffy job as well. I'd said, I'd read in interviews that they were on about getting another guitar player. And I was like, it's me. Look no further. No, it, it, nobody's going to do it better than me. I'm telling you that now. And I'm still doing it now. That was like 15 years ago or something. All right. Well, oh, there you go. That's yeah. amazing. Just ask. Just All you got to do is ask. So we'll get back to that. But the, the Biffy connection. Mm. So there's, there's two things. You're from Manchester. Right. Well, right? I'm from Leeds, but, I, I, from Leeds, yeah, but I've been living in Manchester for like 30 years. Yeah. Right. And Biffy from Glasgow. Yeah. Right. Manchester, I find fascinating musically. Mm. So much amazing, totally unique music. Yeah, yeah. Come out of that place. Um, what is it about Manchester that breeds this sort of, it's like this hotbed of creativity. What is it that other places can learn from that? And then where is the connection 
between you and Simon? How did you guys get together? Well, I think Manchester, I think everybody usually tells you that it's the weather and because it is pretty atrocious for the most part. Um, but I think there's a there's a sort of marked neglect of the North. I know we don't necessarily want to get into politics, but Manchester is, and as the, the whole of North of England has been absolutely shafted by successive Tory governments and all that. I don't really know why Manchester... See me putting on the Manchester accent. I don't really know why Manchester. Um, I don't know why it has this thing happening. It feels like in, in, when I was growing up in Leeds, it didn't feel like there was any kind of infrastructure mm. for bands to be coming through. It didn't. I didn't necessarily feel like there's loads of places to play if you're an up and coming band. Manchester, especially when I moved there in like the mid nineties. There was somewhere for every level of band. Yeah, yeah. Awesome. So you could earn your stripes. Just You could form a band and go and play a gig anywhere. You, it'd be great. Um, and that's certainly what happened for us, you know. Um, but I don't know. There is definitely a gloomy thing to Manchester right. bands. You know, I'm not necessarily a huge Smiths fan or a Joy Division fan. I dig, I dig it. I'm not a, a mad obsessive. Um, but I do like... That there's there there is this thread of 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 interest in stuff, and then you know it, it gets to like the the early ninety late eighties early nineties, and it's just suddenly the drugs come in and yeah. it all goes crazy. I, I, it's a fascinating romantic story. I must admit, I was a bit of a gobshite about it when I moved to Manchester because I was like, I just it, it it seemed to celebrate itself so much right. that it was like there's no room for some psychedelic rock band to come in with three guitars and. It's like you're in the wrong place, you know. You, we don't do that shit here, and I kind of resented it. Uh, but ultimately, it's such a vibrant city. Mm. It still is. Still is. Um, they yeah. try to sort of gentrify it, and you know, close venues down, and you know, the, the pandemic didn't help. Move the BBC in. All that stuff. So to to me, I just, I I'll never move anywhere because all I the only time I really like going out is going to see bands. I do that all all week, every week. Uh, and if you if you like doing that, then Manchester's the place to mm. do it, really. I was up there a little while ago. I don't know if you know Aziz Ibrahim. Oh, yeah. I don't know him, but I know of him. Yeah, yeah. And uh, and, and he's a mate. And, and I was up there um, seeing uh, seeing Phil Manzanera with Roxy Music. Right. And I, oh, I'll call it uh, Aziz, and, and, you know, we're going to have dinner. And... That was it a just giant name dropping down. It was, <laughs> it was, it was, it was. <laughs> and, um, uh, you know, Aziz is an absolute monster and a really creative genius. And he, his Manchester roots, it feels, have, have played so much a part in his, you know, his uh, sort of ability, in, you know, to bring all that stuff out of him. And just going around Manchester, it does, it feels so vibrant. And there's, yeah. you know, the bunch of places that we went into is like the creative um, energy in this place kind of doesn't feel like anywhere else I've yeah. really been to in, in England. I agree. And I don't know what that is, but I could feel it. You know, I, I moved there when I was 19 and I could just feel it. Right. And, and, you know, I was lucky because I, I went to... Uh, university there to study music because that's I'm, I'm that's why i know a few tricky notes and stuff like that, that. saves me a question right yeah, there yeah, you yeah, go yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah um then that's where oceanside's kind of met and I'd, I'd met a couple of the other dudes back in wakefield college and um, but it did feel like you know you immediately as soon as we formed oceanside we got pally with a few other bands who had and there was somewhere for us all to be yeah, somewhere right. it, there, there was places for us to have parties and play all night jam all night and it, you know, I don't know if it's like that anymore because I'm too old for all that stuff. But it felt like such a magical happening mm. that it just felt right and it felt natural and it just felt like all these bands would, if they weren't from Manchester, you'd move there yeah. because you, you'd find your people, right. you know? Okay. Yeah. yeah. And, and then where did the Biffy connection, Simon connection come in? Well, this is an oft-told story, so I, I, I'm sorry if anybody's sick of hearing this, but I, it, there is only really one story. Ocean Size were about to sign to Beggar's Banquet Records, uh, a really cool independent label. They had this band, Biffy Clyro, that was their latest signing. 
we get a gig with this band, Biffy Clyro, at the Night and Day Cafe in Manchester. Amazing venue in town. Um, I go there every week for a pint. It's brilliant. Um, and I just thought, with a name like Biffy Clyro, I thought they were going to be like some psychedelic Welsh folk rock band, like <laughs> Gorky Zygotic Monkey or something like that. And then, you know, they come on and, you know, they're all like smoking fucking shoe polish before, just as they walk up to the stage, I'm like, Christ, who is this man? And then, you know, they go straight into like 57 or something, like Metal Zone, just three of them. They're all seemingly singing lead vocals, the, you know, at the end of every song, each one of them says thanks. And you can't tell, everything's so happening so fast, they're so loud and so furious. And you can't, it's like they're all the lead singer. They've all got the same voice. They're all this beautiful Scottish, yeah. smoky uh, twang to them. And we were just smitten immediately. We didn't really hang out very much that night, but we got put on tour with them and just totally fell in love. You know, it, they just, they, they bring out the best in me particularly. I'm not a, much of a social animal. I'm not very good at meeting people, but they're really wholesome, yeah, so well so brought up lads. And they can make, a, you can sit and have a conversation about a Frappuccino for 20 minutes and it'll be the most in-depth, <laughs> into, well, intelligent, fun chat you'll have, you'll have ever had. They're just really warm. Yeah. And uh, I think that that's what it is with, you know, you tend to sort of gravitate to people who... who who, who you care about and who care about you. And sure. I really, I, I just fell in love with them yeah. in that respect, you know. Yeah. They're an example to us all. They yeah. really are because yeah. I'm, I, I don't know, I'm I'm not from that kind of upbringing. It's, I don't know, I'm, it's, it's quite a cynical place where I'm from. Right. And they're just not like that. They're just really friendly, good time lads. Sure. They're great to be on tour with. Yeah. It's really blessed. And at the same time, and I, you know, much like yourself, and, and you would have experienced this obviously, being in that circle for so long, every gig is like everything is super, you know, life or death. Every, yeah, yeah. You know, they, they they really do play every gig like it's their last, and you can just feel it. It's ne they never phone it in. Yeah, never. So what's it like being? Um, I'm sure you all, all all know by now, but Mike uh, plays with Biffy live. Um, you know, has been touring with Biffy for forever i mean it's pretty awesome to, yeah you know oh, it was the jackpot man but i was the scourge of every guitar player in the uk for a while there <laughs> who's this guy oh god he's so embarrassing as you think he is and i'm like i know i'm sorry but you know if not me then who you know um no I, look they they were and are one of my most favorite bands of all mm, time mm. and it wasn't just going to hang out with them I wanted to see him play, so I'd, I'd follow him all over the place. Um, and so, yeah, he's suddenly like, I'm helping them make that noise. I couldn't believe it. I still can't, you know. Some great footage of, because Gambler's also in the in the Biffy yeah, band is, as well. Yeah, yeah, I mean, yeah. That, that must be great. It's all right. It's yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Gambler plays Sax keys. Saxophone. saxophone. He's on the sax. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He's on the vibe. He plays slap. the spiders. Uh, <laughs> no, he's great. I mean, you know. Yeah, you've been you've been mates a long time. Yeah, I've time. known him since '92. Wow, wow, <laughs> epic. So we were about to hear some sounds there. Uh, we jumped forward to Empire State Bastard, which is the band we were talking about. Right. So is this? We'll talk about that other guitar in a second. Yeah, I believe that was one of your first guitars. It really was. Right? Yeah, okay. yeah. But jumping forward, so we, we've come to. Uh, it, this is just a, a Gibson Les Paul studio that really wasn't my friend for a good long while but um What's i that? know it's a I know. string butler basically i was it, this thing wouldn't stay in tune for about seven years it was driving me insane i took all kinds of recommendations so that is basically helping the sort of break angle yeah yeah um helps a lot but it was just tuners so but for the amount of money i've spent on it i might as well have bought a proper les paul <laughs> um but no it, this sort of somehow became the esb guitar i, I for the record i used a an explorer with a tone zone in because I love the tone. That's the tone zone in that squire. Is it? Right. That's a Dimarzio. Dimarzio tone yeah, zone, yeah, yeah, just yeah. stupid loud, stupid mid range, <laughs> brutal shreddy pickup. Um, but yeah, but I just I just started using this. It just seemed to have more chunk. But it was a P90 originally in there, but they're no good for sort of dime bagisms, you know. Um, so Matt from Monty's built me a Firebird, which has got ah. plenty of twang, but yeah. plenty of sort of 
it's like that telly on steroids mm -hmm. thing. Really, it's got plenty of cut and balls. Let's have a listen. Yeah, okay. And maybe we can have a little flick through the pedal board as well. Okay. Shall I turn? Uh, well, this one's already. That on. one's on. This one on. Yeah, go for it. So this is my main distortion for this stuff. <laughs> So there'll be people all over the internet having bought baritones and endless amp packs and mm -mm -mm. speaker IRs <laughs> and all of that. And here we are with a standard scale, well, uh, compared Gibson to Fenders, scale, you might yeah. say, or short scale. Gibson, um, Les Paul, tune down. Well, see, this is it. I always used to sort of bat for the other team. I was Fender till I die. And I still am because I, I, I really love sort of clean, chimey mm. sounds, you know. But for this Empire State Blaster stuff, it just it kind of had to be a Gibson. It's just there's a there's a push in that sort of lower mid range that I can't really get from any other guitar, and uh, I only started really getting this sound together when I tuned to C standard. It was like oh my god, the riffs just started writing themselves, um, and it's just a really inspiring tuning. It just makes the the guitar sort of resonate in your hand. I can just feel, it's like playing a piano or something. It's really, really magic. So it's all the same intervals of a normal exactly, standard, yeah. but you just, the, that's low C. Okay. Yeah, you're just down to C. Right. Oh, okay. How, how thick are the strings to get I'm on those? 13 to 56. Wound G is, is an oh, important part, wow. otherwise it won't stay in tune. Oh, okay. Yeah. Wow. No Th way. There's something about the volume it's like sat here when we you were getting a sound together before and and Mick and I are having a real moment because we we haven't had a sound like this or a guitar player like you being able to navigate these sounds because it, it is something that you have to wrestle these sounds to the ground to take control of otherwise they'll just walk all over you mm -hmm. right and you've got such a handle on it but I'm stood over there and I had this revelation that the volume that you play it with these sorts of sounds at that volume i don't have to listen to anything because it's going right through me mm. i just have to be it just sort of puts me in the moment mm. it's the most extraordinary thing and then after that i went and had the best bowel movement i've had in <laughs> years it just everything loosened up and it was just peachy um but <laughs> But it is just the most extraordinary thing. Thanks, man. It's we. It, I mean, like I've had experiences watching loud bands like My Bloody Valentine and Sun and all that, where you just kind of you're so captivated, and you. It's meditative in the respect that your brain won't allow you to have any other thoughts. So you're just too busy absolutely captivated by wondering what the fuck is making how what is happening yeah. you know like they've saw my bloody valentine used to do this thing called the holocaust section where it was like half an hour of just pitchless noise to the point where you know i think the the, the this mix guy used to famously wear noise <laughs> wear earphones like i'm not listening to this and um you you know you couldn't you couldn't really you just couldn't think about anything other than is this building about to collapse? You know, it's yeah. just, so I, you know, I could watch now. I could, I could happily watch an, another hour of that stuff. It's and just, it puts you in a certain place, right? Yeah, you, you're, you're all, everything just evaporates. Nothing else matters. You're just there. You yeah. Know, it's brilliant. And there's, and in that point, there's no going, hmm, it sounds like a tube screamer from night. I know exactly. Yeah. That special capacitor. Yeah. He's got the wrong chip in that round. Yeah. Man. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It just, it just takes over. Yeah. Right. Yeah, <laughs> amazing. So we start off with the rat then for that. Yeah, that's kind of the main distortion that sits through the pedals amp. And then, I mean, there's a bunch of stuff on here I'm not using, but as I've said earlier, I can't get the pedals off the board. Your man Jake at Gig Rig has made this thing like he works for fucking NASA. And I can't <laughs> get the pedals off the board. So they have to just stay there. Uh, so the other one I'm using is this 
Big Muff clone, from which it goes like this. so good it's, your style is fascinating so you've got all the chug and all of that but you've also got a lot of facility uh in terms of lead playing and all of that how does that how did that develop like i say i just got i was a shredder when i was a kid and yeah. um yeah, I just got right into all that. I was never much of a speed picker. I was always quite legato y. Mm. And then when I went to college, everybody was upset. I was like, oh, you know, you're no good unless you can play as fast as Malmsteen and all that. And I was just never into all that, really. I just, it was all like picking the wrong notes and and making a bit of a noise with it. And I just, I don't know. I, I, like, everybody kind of carried on doing, being into Motley Crue. And I was like, no, I'm, I'm, you, you go on. I'm, I'm all right. And I just went somewhere else with it. And, but there's a swing in your playing as well. There so is. I'm going to say Maiden. I'm oh, yeah. going to say oh, God, yeah. a lot of that. Uh, when rock turned into metal, yeah, it, I can I can hear and feel a lot of yeah. Of, I of mean, that. like it, you know, I went to see Maiden three times last month and just <laughs> yeah, I far, fucking love Iron Maiden. Um, <laughs> and you know, I've I've always kind of because I you know when I was ten I got into them and I think that. Although Dave Murray and Adrian Smith are pretty different styles mm. of players, I, 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 I've kind of nicked loads of stuff from both of them. Mm. I just love them both. You know, fucking like, we call Adrian Smith the dude. You know how like every band's got the dude, you know, like <laughs> Ronnie Wood, he's the dude in the Stones. Izzy Stradlin's the dude in Guns N' Roses. Adrian Smith is the fucking dude of Iron Maiden. He's just, his playing is like silk, man. He's just, ah, oh, so much feel, you know. The swing thing you mentioned is really interesting because I was next door and you were doing something here and you were playing lines and it sounded like a sax. Yeah, it sounded yeah. like a sax player warming up. The legato, I guess. <laughs> but you were, but you, were, you were moving through changes uh, and it was really interesting. It didn't sound like you were playing scales. Yeah. Just, you know, but there was a swing to it. It was really I, I, cool. I'm kind of interested in it. I was, sorry, this is a bit of a tangent, but demographically it's interesting because when you started playing guitar, you know, right up to then being a professional musician, it was such a time of change in music. Yeah. But we didn't have the internet. Yeah. Or at least it was way into that before there was any kind of internet, before you could hear any other kind of music. So you were, ha you were having to discover that music. Mm. Absolutely, in an yeah. analog fashion. Yeah. yeah, and so it was. You know, I was a total metal kid, just obsessed with Maiden and and Ozzy and all that. And then slowly things just started changing. So it was Jane's Addiction first of all. I was like, oh wait yeah. a minute, these these this is pretty strange. Uh, the and then that led led me to Faith No More, and that changed everything because Faith No More, with Mike Patton singing, he's like, well, where's he come from? What yeah. is he into? And that's how yeah, I discovered yeah. Cardiacs, and that's. You know, that whole realm, that family of bands just absolutely changed everything for me, you know. And again, it's that thing of it, it's it's finding the wrong notes that work yeah. correctly. And I'm just, I'm still on that quest. It'll never end. Where were you with Soundgarden? Oh, fucking love them. Yeah. Oh, so I was, I've was i been listening to a bunch of Mike's stuff over the last few days and I, I think I can hear a bit of Chris in your voice. Chris right, Cornell. yeah. I'm a bit like Joel Longthorne. I sound like loads of different people, yeah, depending on what should, song I'm doing. Funny you should mention Mike Patton, because I hadn't I know, put that I know. together. And, I mean, I mean over... he's the reason I started singing him and Bruce Dickinson. Yeah. Wow. <laughs> I can say that now. I, I weren't allowed to say that when I were in Oceanside. Don't mention Iron Maiden. Shut up about Iron Maiden. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, it's awesome, yeah. Because if we hadn't mentioned, and if you're if you're new to Mike, um, he is also a pretty phenomenal vocalist as well. So. Mm. How important has that been to Singing. your journey? Um, I, when I lived in Leeds, and let's say it's quite a cynical place, you can't you can't go around saying, "Oh, I'm, I'm a singer" as well. People, go, you know, yeah, and call you some kind of homosexual slur. Yeah. And then when I moved to Manchester, I just went around telling everybody I was a singer. 
And I thought, well, if nobody knows, then, you then it's all right. Yeah. It's like when, yeah. you know, like when I were really young, I refused to get my hair cut unless it was a school holidays because you'd get the piss taken out of you if you had your hair cut. So I'd go in in the school holidays with a new haircut and they'd be like, oh, haircut. It's like, it's been like for ages, dickhead. Whereas, and that's what it was like. I'm not like, now, no, I've always been a singer. And so I just, um, it, it turned out I'd, I was all right at it. So I got, I just joined loads of bands. I They're hope like, people across the world will, will join in that universal recognition of childhood. Because <laughs> I really hope it's not a uniquely British thing. Uh, what oh, was that really all about? It's haircut. Really yeah. Haircut. Yeah, yeah, yeah. New shoes. New shoes. Yeah. New shoes. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, God. Well, maybe that doesn't happen anymore. I don't know. Yeah. I don't know. Okay, we've got two pedals in. Um, <laughs> uh, um, do you want to go for the Doom Saw now? Have yeah. we done that one yet? Yeah, we did. We, we did, did that, that one. one earlier, but it would be nice to hear it with the with the Lester, just to hear, okay. the, hear the difference. Okay. So I need to be I need to be quicker with the standby switch. <laughs> no, it's I keep hitting the doom. Right. Okay, that was a nice comparison of the muff and the doom. Completely different mid-range character. Yeah. yeah. Uh, you mentioned Sun earlier. Yeah. Is is this in current yeah. rotation? This yeah, pedal? it's the uh, life pedal, which it's when you absolutely have to kill every Everyone motherfucker in the room, room. you know. Um, it's not a, an always-on pedal. <laughs> That's for damn sure. I mean, it sure is for them. Uh, but, yeah, a couple of times in the set that just has a, a lushness to it. That Especially when you have... Because I've got the, the, the delay on, only on one amp as well, and so you get this wonderful spread of crazy... I'll get, hang on, I'll play it. So this one's in... Drop the uh, drop A sharp, and yeah. then so if I turn that off and that on, yeah, yeah. It purrs, you know, and that's yeah, what I like yeah. is is for, for things to have a certain grain to the distortion, you know. It's like it's like a full gamma of gamma of experiences. <laughs> it's alarming, mm. it's a bit scary, but it's also like redeeming or something there's, weird there's like a, that. There's a great peace in it. There's <laughs> a there's a pleasantness to it that is weird. Yeah. Because I'm looking at the DB meter going, okay. You know that's loud, but it's not it's, painful. It's not at all. I, I'm just sitting there going, I sit like this for hours. It's really beautiful. <laughs> it's like a bath of music. Yeah. And that's what I love about that. You've only got a single analog delay on your board. You know, like I've got flanges and multiple delays and reverbs and stuff. You're getting all your atmosphere from changing your gain sounds and every now and then adding a single delay on the board yeah, it's amazing yeah. that's mainly just to uh, to, to um, spread it out a bit but um you know it, when i was in ocean size and when i do make in fact with biffy as well i'll have two or three delays sure. just for different things analog and 
Uh, and I'll, I'll usually stack them up as well. So right. you just it, it's that kind of big spread washy stuff. I love doing all that. But for for Empire State Bastard, which is th that's the board that I'm using for this, it's just there's no room for for right. pretty or anything. It's just kind of to it's just it's got to be like that three inch punch thing, you know. <laughs> Yeah. So, um, and is Simon's rig kind of similar to what he would use Biffy? Words? He's not playing guitar. Oh, is he not? No. Just singing. He's oh, playing a bit not, of keyboards. I did not know that. Yeah, yeah. No way. Yeah, he's. You know, he'll tell you this himself that like when he when he plays guitar, he, whatever he does, it just ends up sounding like Biffy because he's got a really sort of specific style. You know, he was a real hero to me when I first met him. I was like, yeah, yeah. fuck, I want to do that. Especially, you know, his sort of unusual chord yeah, voices. Yeah, 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 yeah. You know, you just you put in all that, um, that harmonic content through a metal zone. Like, who the fuck does that? You yeah, know, yeah. it's incredible stuff. Um, but yeah, he, he just didn't want to play guitar on any of this. It's just so, it, you know, I'd written it to be just fifths. And, you know, there's the occasional huge spread of, of lush sort of guitar and that. But yeah, for the most part, it's just fifths all the way. And that's that. How does... So for anyone watching that is inspired by this, and I, and I must say I really am. It's a completely different experience that I'm used to. I'm going to take Zach. This, and, this is and, Dan's new direction. Tis, yeah, hope yeah. you enjoy this. Yeah, he, I he said wrote, him once, I said it a thousand times. He wrote this. <laughs> <laughs> and Puppet Show. And Puppet Show. Uh, <laughs> um, how, how do you start... When you're playing before, and there, there'll be a clip, you would just you could just play a chord, and then let it let the sound fill the room, and then you just move, and the sort of the harmonic oscillation, oscillation start yeah. happening, and creating these different beats, and then uh, where do you start? If someone wants to get into this. What's the, what's the absolute <sighs> things they need to get when, a handle? When on? I got into it, I remember just like you know the first time you make your guitar feedback. You know when I was a yeah, kid, yeah, and yeah, you're yeah. just like feeling notes oscillating in a different way, just moving around doing that. And it's much the same thing. Just you know if you've if you've got a, a couple of distortions, it's not you know it's not hard at all but it's just fun it just feels good um you know there's no real technique to it just as, especially because you know i really like um i can i've got not i don't think i've got perfect pitch but i've got relative pitch mm -hmm. so i can hear like the relation between specific intervals and what it will what sort of color it has i really like getting into stuff like that right so being this a kind of a, a drone kind of technique if you will it's what the notes how they relate to each other and how they react to each other and how the pedals and the amp react to that and that's where the fun's at really because like when you had noel on the on the show the other day I just you know him talking about it's like the amps are a living, breathing thing. And I mm. totally relate to that. Because I've got all, you know, I've got things at home what I used to demo with, that are, you know, digital things. But there's no way you can get that. You, you can't have that kind of fun with, um, unless you've got the real air moving and, and, and real speakers and all that. I just, I don't know. To me, that's 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 my, that's where I get my kicks anyway. Just when, when you set up before and you bought in, you know, 200 watt heads, oh. Uh, your your own signature amp from Matt Amp as well. Um, you know, we were already doing a little dance of joy before we even turned them on. It was really great. I was lifting one out of a flight case, going big output transformer. I'm happy. Yeah. <laughs> but then when you when when they turned on and, and we were first punched in the face by that yeah. wall of sound, it was it was like, oh yeah, this is it's a really important thing for people. That's where that relationship is, right? That's where you start to develop that dynamic and the interplay between the guitar and what's going on that. Mm. And and I think for for kids who are really inspired by these sorts of sounds, just to have that experience of what it's like yeah. to be sat in front of a loud amp yeah. and because um, it's it's arresting. Yeah, you know, and you know not what just I mean? kids either. Anyone, yeah, yeah, anyone, any, anyone. anyone. Yeah. Mm. So for for a long time. Uh, with Biffy, I was using an ISO cab. We just wanted to run the stage as quietly as possible to, so that we could get enough of the vocals out and all that. And, you know, I, I was happy with the sound, but I wouldn't have been able to do anything like this. Yeah, yeah, it's, yeah, um, yeah. So, like, in, in recent years, since I got the amp specifically, 
Um, I've just been sort of given free reign to, oh, yeah, go for it, you know, have, have, have a proper cabinet on stage. And I'm just, I can't believe I've been missing out this long. It just <laughs> feels so different, you know. It's... Just for the record then, it, it, Venart Matamp, what, what is that? Well, um, I'd wanted a Matamp for years, um, but I'm, I'm, I'm a bit of a, you know, what is it, gear acquisition syndrome? I'm a bit of a fucker for that because I'm always like, oh, and then, and then another thing. And once I've got that, everything will be fine. But I had wanted a Matt Amp for years. Uh, I'm a big sleep fan. Yeah. Um, and I was like, bugger it. And I went to the factory and met those guys, really small place, really close-knit company, and just tried everything out that they had. And mm. that's the GT1. And uh so I got that and it's wonderful. When I did the album, I used that amp and no pedals whatsoever. Um, just the amp distortion with varying degrees of, of of volume. And then when you when I if you listen to there's a track called The Lumen, mm. that is full gain, full master volume. It's just the amp just absolutely going for it. And it's mm. it's monster, it's brilliant. And next Amazing. to that we've got uh, what looks like a vintage orange. Yeah, 1978 orange overdrive, which I found on eBay and I got it off this lady and she told me it used to belong to if you remember McCallman and Butler. Yeah. That song yes. Yeah. That song yes starts with a wee guy kicking the shit out of a drum kit. It was his amp. Ah. No longer with us, sadly, but there he goes. Okay. Yeah. So that nice. amps Older than you? No, not quite. Not quite? Not quite. No, 70, be... I'm 76. Oh, okay. All right. There you go. <laughs> yeah. Maths, people. <laughs> um... related chat then so uh let's zip back to was it what 98 beginning of ocean size yeah somewhere around then that sort of coincided mid late 90s with the kind of pedal i guess it, yeah i mean it did resurgence yeah. Yeah. so back then you would have had a vastly smaller yeah uh access to well if you'd if you could have gone on the internet in 1998, which you could have done, but not many people necessarily yeah. had internet access then. No. Um, and you search for guitar pedals, you'd have found about 25. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> or more than that. But anyway, it was nothing like it is now. How has that worked out for you 
over that time. So presumably then it was whatever you could get your hands on. Yeah, I mean, it, I remember one of the first, I mean, like, what you know, I was a kid, I had like the boss, I had the metal zone, obviously, like everybody else. Mm. Um, and then it was the whammy pedal was the first time where I went, all right, I can, and, and, you know, getting a couple of delays to go with that. It's like, now I can do things that, that are not, you know, not sort of regular common or garden generic guitar sounds. It's like an aphaser and stuff like that, and just mixing those things up and, and just again treating it like it was a synth or something mm. and just trying to Ocean Size was all about texture, especially yeah, yeah, yeah. in the early days. And it was just we wanted to, you know, it, it was it was a psychedelic band. We wanted it to sound like how we felt when we were partying, you know, that's all it was. Um so yeah, like phases, I you know, I still had this, it was like a Dodd stereo phaser. Yeah. yeah. That you'd turn it on and your amp would be twice as loud at least and it was like you know it just took over the sound of the entire band it was like only use that once in the set otherwise <laughs> there's right no the point end. the rest of us actually playing because you just can't hear anything but yeah that, the, and the, the whammy you know I, with Ocean Size I, I, I couldn't have done a gig without a whammy yeah. pedal I use it on every song you know yeah. amazing stuff I'm just wondering about that transition of where you're f you're because there is a limit to what you can use, you're forced in a, to a different creative space mm. than you are. Yeah, if you've yeah. got option paralysis. So you kind of have to get out of what you have, everything you can. Well, it was great for Ocean Size because when we started, it was kind of just a Friday night social. It's like, get, let's get together with a few cans, maybe some mushrooms and plug everything in and have some fun. And it was all, that's all we did, you know, and, and that kind of stuff lends itself to that kind of, you know, it's, it was just supposed to be for fun. And, you know, we'll see where we are in six months if we want to do a gig. But what fascinates me about that process is how you get together to have a bit of fun and then albums of these freaking songs sort of manifest into reality. It's mm. just... It was a really, really special band. And I think like one of our friends referred to us, referred to us as a farm that grows music. That's all we did was just play all the time, you know. Magic. And then so coming forward from there, then this huge proliferation of pedals happens. Mm. Did you fall deeply into that? Do you? Yeah, I, I still, that? I still am. I'm still a, a, an absolute demon for it. My favorite brand at the moment is uh, Death by Audio. Yeah, yeah okay. So because good. they kind of, even though everything kind of does the same thing, and, I, and every time that it's, you know they bring out a new one, I'm like, oh, I don't need that. And then sure enough, I end up buying it. They're you, just the best. You said earlier you're not a reverb guy. What's that? What you got? No, uh, have you God, tried this? No, no. no you're going to take it away with you. Ow! It's the kaleidoscope. Mike said earlier that he's not really a reverb. Player. No, no. We want to change you. Hell, man. <laughs> bring it on. Excellent. Yeah. It is the most spectacular sounding. Right, no way. Totally made for you. Right. Yeah, bonkers far out. Reverb. Oh, that's Jupiter. It looks isn't it? brilliant. Yeah, it's not a death. It looks yeah, yeah. exactly like Death by Audio. Yeah, yeah. So with, there's another Death by Audio one over the, over the road that is also a reverb, but that right. is also a reverb by Jupiter. Anyway. Yeah, I am yeah, yeah. man. Yeah, we'll turn you into a reverb junkie. Right. Indeed. <laughs> indeed. <laughs> One final question on the kind of being constrained thing, and this might be a bit of, uh, I might be assuming too much here. Being left-handed, mm. your access to guitars yeah, is much, that been like? much more limited. It was awful in, in when I was a kid. Yeah. And it used to sort of feed into, so I'd go into a guitar shop, and it's still much the same now, and there's all these incredible guitars that are, no good to me and that I can't even dream about playing them and that but that used to feed into my psyche as like I can't go in a shoe shop either because none of these shoes fit me it was just weird shit like that I was like no you're okay it's just it only works for certain things that you're okay <laughs> this piano is can't be you can't be angry about that as well um but yeah that I've you know this guitar yeah tell us about this yeah so my ma got me this um for Christmas when basically because I'd been playing for a couple of years at that point and uh, so they knew I'd, I was taking it seriously because it weren't just like a fad, like a skateboard or anything. So she got me this and it was, it, it used to be just a regular black and white strap and I loved it. Um, somewhere there's a picture of me like on Christmas day playing it next to the dog and I can tell that the shape that I'm playing, I'm playing Crazy Train by Ozzy. <laughs> 
which years later, by the way, I had to show Simon Neal how to play that <laughs> so he could play it with Slash while Ozzy Osbourne watched <laughs> this guy. <laughs> I was like, why am I playing? I fucking, I, I'll play it. And really, anyway. Um, but yeah, this guitar has just been like, uh, it was just, it's still my sort of center of gravity. It's the one that I'd go back in the house if it was on fire. It's for, uh, by, I got it in 1987 and 1991 or two, I let my mate monkey around with it. Um, this is a bit of a about turn here, but I got a, an Ibanez Roadstar 2, oh, right? Oh, yeah. Because I wanted That's a Floyd great. Rose. I decided that when I got a Floyd Rose, I was going to take over the fucking world. <laughs> and I got one. What year was this? Uh, we're talking 1988 at this point. No, 89, 90, 90, 90 right? Because you just heard Passion and Warfare or something? Exactly, yeah, exactly. Or something like All that. that stuff. Yeah. So I had this Roadstar 2 and I took it to school. And I was walking around with it on my back, like fucking John Bon Jovi. <laughs> I went to take a piss and the, the button came out and it smashed on the floor. The Floyd Rose just smashed in two. And I was like, ah. Um, so I took out these pickups out of that guitar. The Roadstar 2 is, by the way, I spotted it the other day. It's the guitar that Marty McFly is playing in Back to the Future when Huey Lewis says to him, you're too damn loud. Yeah. That's the road tattoo. And I was like, there it is. Um, so I took the pickups out and that's these. These are really, really tasty. I just love the clean sound of these. It's really chimey and nice. This is a Dimaggio Tone Zone, which my mate picked out for me. Uh, I was in a band with a lot of older dudes because I was like 13, but nobody could play when I was 13. So I just ended up being in bands with these dudes who were like in their early 30s. Are they those EMG Selects or something? No, they're just Ibanez. Are they? Okay. Yeah, yeah. So that's brilliant. That's loud. Obviously, you know, it had to be pink, so the big Steve I fan. And let's say I wanted a trem because I thought, well, I have to, I have to have one. It this thing has always been awful. <laughs> it would not, it wouldn't lock or anything. So for years, this guitar was completely unplayable. I gave it to Gambler, who was doing a guitar building course at the time. And like I say, he built his own guitar. He couldn't play. He sorted this out, stripped it all off, put locking machine heads on, refretted it, gave me it back, and it was like I just never touched another guitar for wow. years. Wow. So cool. um, as a matter of fact, the Ibanez RG550 that I've been playing in the meantime, I put that in a guitar bag, didn't touch it for 15 years, took it out of the bag, and it was still perfectly in tune. Wow. Those locking machine, yeah. head, locking tuners and all that, it's like, it's fucking incredible. It's just like pristinely in tune. But anyway, so yeah, this is every guitar that I get since I try and make it sound like this um, because it just does that. I mean, it's completely unbalanced. That's mm. stupidly loud. These are just pretty hot single coils, but it's acoustically a really loud guitar, you know. Yeah. And I love it. Um, yeah, I just, I, you know, I've always this recurring nightmare of guitars getting lost. In fact, the reason I stopped touring this guitar is it nearly perished in a Metallica-centric riot. <laughs> this one time we were playing with Metallica in India and they had to cancel the gig just before we, we were supporting them and we had to cancel it just before we started playing because uh, the, uh, the barrier at the front was made of bamboo. So uh, it split. And so we were like, lads, gigs cancelled. It's turned into an episode of Phoenix Night. I know. And then so we had, and this guitar was on the stage. I was like, they're going to riot. And they did. And they burnt the place to the ground. Oh, my God. Um, but And rightly so, because they'd all spent like three months wages getting tickets Trying for the first again, yeah. ever Metallica show. So that was it. I've wow. never gigged it since, really. There's a, I don't know much about the Squire story, but I do know that there's a period. Oh, yeah, yeah. Um, uh Steve Rothery, who's a man of mine, has a yeah. squire. Oh, yeah, that yeah. Is, that is really connected with. I fucking love him. And I grew up, like, I used to be able to play the whole of, of Misplaced Childhood. Really? Don't uh -huh. tell anyone. <laughs> <laughs> we, my band supported them, and we, we you know, yeah. good friends of Steve's. Uh, we're going to get Steve on at some point. But I was uh, at Real Worlds, and they were doing some recording. He says, oh, you know, here's my old squire. Yeah, yeah. And I thought, oh, squire. Yeah, yeah. And I played yeah. it. Far out. Yeah, they're the best. Amazing. It's the uh, early to mid 80s. This is well, it, between 84 and 87. Right. And you couldn't even get them in the UK. They were made in Japan. Yeah. So my mum had to have, like, order it from Japan and it showed wow. up on Christmas Eve. 
Oh. And that was my guitar man. And sorry, how old were you again? I was 11. 11. Oh, that's amazing. How flipping cool is that? Can yeah. I see your plectrum? Yeah, I thought that. Is that a 78 or something? I don't know. Yeah, it's not very f fat. So those massive, crushing, huge tones. There you go. It doesn't require a flipping dumpster. No, I went through, when I was a shredder, I went through a case, a, 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 a phase of using those stubbies, remember that, that oh, craze yeah. that went yeah, around yeah. and you're like, yeah. can't even hold the bloody thing, but it was like. <laughs> yeah. You can't chug with them though, no way. <laughs> Oh man, this has just been awesome. <laughs> um, what haven't we heard? Because people will be going, I haven't that's heard that. kind of a lot, really. I don't use anything else. Okay. At all. Um, yeah, that's that's it. <laughs> there's there's I had this on the precision drive. Um a mate got just gave it to me. It was a guy from Periphery. Yeah, oh, okay. yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Uh and he yeah, I, I I was like, I, it's good for the transients and all that when yeah. I was recording, but it scoops a little bit of bottom end out of the mat amp. That, that's right. the only pedal that would be going to the mat amp. Okay. But I I can I can tell when it's on and when it's off, and right. I'm like, as long as I crank the gain hard enough on that, then it'll give you that kind of three inch punch kind of thing. You know? Sure. Uh, but it scoop, scoops out too much bottom. So this is like a a wet dry rig, but imagine that all the Pedals are wet, yeah, and, yeah. and that's the wet amp, yeah. and you've got a, a proper dry amp. Yeah. That's so cool. And I guess um, one thing I did want to ask you about is the other thing that struck me listening to quite a big catalog catalog of music in a short amount of time is the consistency in the sonics of it. Yeah, yeah, right? like dense mixes with loads going on and yet everything clear, guitar's perfectly audible. Mm. That thing we were talking about earlier with the bottom end, vocals sat in, in the most beautiful, beautiful place. Who are you producing? Is there other producers involved? Um, the Ocean Size stuff was all uh, kind of self-produced, but um, you know we'd always make sure we had a, a really good guy to mix it. Yeah. And you know a really good engineer as yeah. well to, to make sure it went in sounding great. Uh, Chris Sheldon looked after all that for the most part, and he was just incredible, you know, mm. absolutely amazing. Uh, and then my stuff, I just did it myself. Um, so uh, you obviously have a pretty serious interest. No, no, really? I don't know what I'm doing. I don't know what I'm doing. I don't know about... Uh, no. Really? No, I honestly, I, I'm a presets guy. So, so the Venot record. Yeah, records. I just produce, I just... Yeah, as long as it sounds good going in, I'll get somebody to record the drums for me. Uh, with you know, because I don't know how to work a desk or anything, and I don't know about you know, no, really, <laughs> that's amazing. Even like using a you know, because I know that compression makes everything sound better. I don't really know how to work a compressor though, so I just sort of flick through the presets and go, yeah, that's that's there it is. Um, <laughs> and same with a lot of stuff, you know. Um, that's why all these are just. I mean, I don't know how to work this yet, and and so when something goes wrong with it, I'm going to be in trouble. But you know. Luckily, I've got Lee to look after me or Churd to look after me. Yeah, I'm sure it is easy. Be, I'm just not very good at things like that. <laughs> no, you, you, you'll be fine. Yeah. Um, <laughs> Churd sent me a message. He was gutted he couldn't be here today. Oh, yeah. He said to send his love. Yeah. My oh, beautiful man. Yeah. What a uh, blessing. Could literally do this for hours. Actually, when we stop the cameras, we will continue. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So... Um, there will be links below in the description text uh, to some stuff you should really listen to. Yeah. Uh, but given the uh, where we are time-wise, Empire State Bastard, check that out. Uh, it's not fully out yet, is it? September the 1st. Okay. On wow. Roadrunner Records. Beep, beep. Roadrunner Records? Yeah. That's awesome, man. I know. Didn't we do well? That is <laughs> <I> did. <laughs> completely awesome. That reminds me of my Metal Hammer days. I know, man. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> Full circle. Uh, so I would imagine by the time this comes out, that will be out. So yeah, yeah. please go and uh, have a listen to that and dip back into Mike's catalogue. Uh, there are some true gems in there. Uh, thank you so much. Thank you so uh, much. It's been, it's been, we've wanted this to happen for such a long time. And, I know, and we've been, been talking so about it for fun, so long. Man. Thank you. We'll have to. We want to say a big thanks to Rob as well for being here today. Yes. Thanks, Rob. Rob. Appreciate it, man. Um, once you've had a play with the... Uh, we're going to send you off with the kaleidoscope wow. and we're going to send you oh, yeah, off gonna, with this as well. We're going to send you off with this as well, uh, which um, uh, to Luke and Anna and Jamie at Earthquaker, 
who were kind enough to send us this Sun pedal. Dan and I have been a bit scared to plug it in because <laughs> we would sound like... We wouldn't sound like that. We yeah, you can't like play that. the blues so through those we're, things, We're going to send it off with, with Mike because he clearly likes oh, this guys. kind of thing. So he, oh. can, he can have a listen to that and uh, and report back to us as well. But Yeah, yeah. yeah. When you get have to come back once you've got some... Awesome reverb going into For the For real, man. Sound stuff. Oh, yeah, yeah. Oh, wow. Yeah, yeah that sounds amazing. Yeah. Fabulous. And in the meantime, Dan, we need to get our doom on. <sighs> yes. Okay. I'll work on it. <laughs> Brilliant. Thank you so much for watching. Uh, subscribe. Um, thanks to our preferred retailers. Thank you to anyone that's gone to thatpedalshowstore.com. Go to thatpedalshowstore.com. Buy stuff. Uh, we will see you on Monday for, v for VCQ. Uh, but till then, have a great weekend. We'll see you soon. Bye. Bye.